between trying to convince people that user experience is more than interfaces and that user experience people do more than just make things look pretty. Uh, that's, those are my two major hurdles. My code is broken. My code is broken. From Huntsville, Alabama, you are listening to My Code is Broken, a podcast by developers for everybody. Here is your host, Dan Nagel. My code is broken. My code is broken. Hello. Thank you for downloading the Pinagle episode of My Code is Broken. No, Pinagle's not a real word. In an attempt to find a word that sounds as significant as inaugural, I came up short. The word for second to the last is called penultimate. So how about the second from the first be called penaugral? I'm going with it. Like before, this episode is divided into two parts, an interview and an essay. Stay tuned after the interview to hear the essay. We also have an overriding theme for the show. It is UX, or user experience. As always, you can post comments on this episode at mycodeisbroken.com, and you can reach me on Twitter at NagelCode. My guest today is UX expert Tara Anzalone. She started her own company, Modern Smart, before finishing college. She is also a community advocate through her work with Rocket Hatch, a nonprofit supporting local startups. This is on top of her working at Dynetics. Let's hear from Tara about her work. I own Modern and Smart, which is a creative agency. We do branding, uh, user experience, and app consulting, and I also work at Dynetics as a user experience expert, and so I do a lot of consulting for government entities on the usability of their products. Did you start Modern and Smart? Yes, so I started Modern and Smart pretty much because I saw... When did you start it? uh, I started it in 2013, so in December, I decided... You know, instead of looking around for a job, I was going to just start my own company. And so I just kind of jumped in both feet first and decided to do it. Did you file an LLC and all that? I filed it on January 3rd. (laughs) So you started in December and a few weeks later you filed it. Yeah, so I would say the idea started in December, and I started kind of seeing if there was interest, if I would have any clients. And Did you have clients before you started it? I had freelance clients for years before I started um, Modern and Smart, and so I handled those through um, different means. Uh, for a while, I was a tertiary subcontractor for one client and so you know there's different legal ways of handling all those kinds of things. You're vice president of the board at Rocket Hatch. How did that come about? Something I was really interested in was building community and I had an incredible time trying to get people to participate when I was in college. I just it felt like I was screaming against a brick wall to get people to actually do things and so that's always going to be a problem yes and so i was excited to enter the adult world of people that wanted to do things and build things and make things so i was trying to build this community here because um i've always wanted to be part of a a bigger city because i thought well, that will solve my problem of there not being a community because if I go join a community where there's already an established status quo. What, what do you consider a bigger city? Um, I mean... In a million or... I would just say somewhere where there's a bigger artistic community or bigger creative community, tech community. So do you feel out of place with a town full of engineers? I would say in the past I certainly have. I, I would say creating a sense of community here has been my my way of finding a place here. I would say for a long time I felt like there wasn't really much of a place for me. Okay. And so through my journey of finding user experience design, of, of finding how I fit in into the tech community, how I could communicate with engineers, creating an entrepreneur community, you know, all the, this whole discovery process has helped me find my place. Well, you, you basically... 
laid out the mission plan of Rocket Hatch. So I imagine that's how you ended up and got involved in Rocket Hatch. Did you go into one of their seminars or classes and? No, actually, it was, it was Twitter. <laughs> Twitter? So, you um, found Rocket Hatch on Twitter? <laughs> no, um, Antonio just tweeted at me one time and said, uh, hey, it looks like we're doing similar things because I was trying to create a community here for creatives. And I was hosting some meetings and trying to basically um, do the same thing that he was trying to do for entrepreneurs. And so I was trying to build so you combined, creative entrepreneurs. So you combined forces. Yeah, so... Um, Shortly after combining forces, we threw our first sip and hatch. So um, I've been wanting to do something like that for a while, and so we just kind of went for it. And right after Rocket City launch, and so we were like, well, let's build on this energy, and we shouldn't have just like one event a year for entrepreneurs. So we discussed it on like a Thursday afternoon, and then I called around to all the bars and restaurants I could think of and said, hey, how would you like for me to bring... 40 to 60 of my closest <laughs> entrepreneur friends to come eat your food and drink your beer. A lot of people said, oh, I'll have to talk to my manager and see if that's okay. That, that can't just be an immediate yes? <laughs> I thought that was a no-brainer, but so the first person that I talked to that was a manager and that, uh, that could talk to me immediately was um, uh, the lady at the Nook that's the current manager, and she I've said, been to the three times. heck yes. <laughs> so that's where we ended up going. The goal is that it's not any one person running Rocket Hatch. Right. Antonio and I both have always said, you know, we, we see it as that it's a community and that there's a different figureheads and that there's that there's not one person that, you know, if they somehow weren't a part of it anymore or they were less part of it, that the community would cease to exist. It's just Rocket Hatch is part of the entrepreneur ecosystem. Right. And that the ecosystem would continue to thrive. So it's always going to be in a state of change. Let's start with the basics. What exactly is UX versus UI? Uh, user experience is everything from going to a store to interacting with social media, how a user moves through a program or a software, uh, even just like how, how they would move through a business. So, you know, do they go into a store? Do they go through a flow online? Uh, and a UI is typically user interface, so that is just how they would interact with um, the data points. So it can be a website like Facebook, or it can be a software like Photoshop, but uh, you're interacting with that, just that interface right there and creating you know, data on the other side. So the user interface, or UI, is just a subset of the user experience. If it's not to simply make the UI pretty, when do we need UX? Ideally, design doesn't happen at the beginning stages or at the end stages. It happens every stage. Uh, so, so it's not top down or bottom up. It's, it's, it's the it's, whole way through. It's the whole way through. Um, and it's kind of like a check and balance. So, um, for instance, an interface I'm working on right now, um, we went and surveyed the users to find out what they're using right now and what that interface is lacking. Do you do a, a lot of developer approach is rapid prototyping. Mm -hmm. Build a prototype, get feedback, build a prototype, get feedback. In UX, would you build a prototype UI, get feedback? There's many ways of doing that. So uh, wireframes is one way of doing it. Some people do rapid iteration, um, computer wireframes, some people do uh, what's called a design uh, role-playing session where they actually sit down with kindergarten supplies of paste, paper, markers, scissors, and they sit down and they figure out what this ideal interface would look like. You can do things like paper prototypes of, um, you know, just printing it out and actually working with it on it with a user. A lot of it has to do with, you know, you want to find out first who your user is and what they're using it for. So a lot of things that have to do with change have to do with misunderstandings. A lot of people think, oh, well, the users want to be able to accomplish, the users need this for this reason. Um, so, for instance, people want to be able to, uh, you know, draw something 
because they think they need this. Well, what, what do they really want to accomplish? What goal are they really trying to get to? So a lot of what we do is finding out what are they really trying to accomplish and how can we do that in a simple way so that they're not um, bloated. Are so, you... I tend to sign on to the idea of if I can eliminate a feature, that would be a good thing to do. Absolutely. Whereas I know a lot of people try to throw in as many features as possible to cover as much ground. So you sign on to the less is more idea. Less is definitely more. So, um, for instance, I've been working with some engineers, and um, they are so knowledgeable about the topic that we're working with, and I find their input to be incredibly valuable but they're coming from a legacy system that's been around for a very long time and so um, when you're working with somebody that's trying to emulate something and they're just like oh we can just update the graphics to really drill down into what the user needs you want to take a look at okay well what's the user workflow what's a day like for the user and some of these engineers they you know they may work with the users or they may not. Um, for instance, one program that I worked on uh, was a music player and you know we sat down and went through what the steps were to get to actually playing a song. There were 27 steps. <laughs> it was too many. Tara touched on this a bit, but there is a notion in engineering called Greenfield. It is when a project is brand new with no legacy craft. Therefore, we can build it correctly with the best design practices. This rarely happens. Usually a project is worked on until an area of ignorance is reached and then help is brought in or not brought in. I'm getting this visual of you as the UX designer working on the UI and then you start doing the back end. Is there a point where you say, okay, I need find a developer to help me finish this back end and then I think of the corollary of the low-level core developer working on this and then that person says okay I need a UX expert to help me clean up my UI unfortunately in my visual the back end core developer never seeks the UX experts help is this the correct uh, does that seem like a, a plausible scenario occurring it is. Um, it's a very plausible scenario. There are, actually, there, there are some developers that have come to Modern and Smart and said, I need UX help. And it's awesome. I mean, we've had some that um, will sign up for some brainstorming time and they just want like a very small focus session where they go through user flow. Um, I mean, one thing that I've really learned is that user experience and branding, uh, business models, they're all very closely linked. So like being able to go with somebody through their whole user experience of how they go through their business is really neat. And so for somebody to say, uh, I'm willing to take help with this and I want your help with this is really great. Uh, and then it also depends on the role. So. With Modern and Smart, I have a little bit more freedom to say, okay, well, this is the role I'm doing right now, and I tend to be a little bit more flexible in that of, okay, right now I'm doing user experience, right now I'm coding. Um, I tend to fill more spots there. Um, but when it comes to back-end development, I definitely tend to call on some of my friends with, their, uh, with those sorts of things. I have developed entire product suites without ever having a name for them. This is actually quite common. In the place of a real name, a code name is used. Windows Vista was called Longhorn for years during the development process. So what to do when you're finally ready to drop the code name? Here's another branding strategy that I try to follow is once you figure out what brand you want, the first thing you do is try to get the .com, then you try to get the Twitter account, then you try to get the Facebook account. For each one and and if you're not going to use them get them so you can protect them is that a good strategy absolutely and, now are there other sites that you would throw into that protection list um i actually i have a couple of tools that i use and before i even choose a brand i check these sites and um 
and tools, and I make sure that uh, the big four are available in addition to the domain. So Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. And then if I think it might be a big video thing, I also check Vimeo. I was wondering if you had thoughts on ICANN recently unloading a whole pile of new domain names and whether or not that even matters anymore because everybody goes to Google to find your brand. Particularly now that I've seen some people who just use Facebook as their primary site anyway. Well, people should not use Facebook as their primary site because Facebook is going to start charging more and more for reach. So if you're using Facebook as your primary site, you may find that Facebook starts charging you to use Facebook as your primary site. But um, as far as the new domain extensions, I find that uh, people are going to always try the .com. Like if they're if they're typing in stuff, they're always going to try to finish it with .com. Um, so, I mean, as we have more businesses and we have more people that are sitting on park domains, it does help to have more extensions. So if you have somebody that has, uh, for instance, a, you know, modernandsmart.com, and they're not using it, it helps to have modernandsmart.co. But, you know, at what point do you stop? Because well, you have modern and smart dot works, dot modern and smart dot work. Well, let me tell you my strategy, and you can let me know if it's a bad idea or not. Mm -hmm. What I do is when I'm thinking of a product or a new brand, I start seeing, okay, what dot com is available. And I will sometimes pick my product name based on the dot com that's available. If I can find the dot com, then I don't even bother registering the other domains. I figure I have something authoritative enough. But what I'm wondering is, should I be concerned where I come up with a domain name or a product brand? The .com is not available, it's taken, it's parked, but dot .something else is available. And am I good to go? Because Google's, Google's what matters. I would say people typically are using Google search now. I mean, even if you type in something on your mobile phone browser, it's it's pulling from Google first. So if you type in, you know, Thai food Huntsville, it's pulling for search results from Google. It's not just, you know, we, we don't even use like .com or go to, you know, some website like Urban Spoon all the time. We just type it in and go. Uh, mobile searching has changed the way that we search in general. But uh, yeah, I would say the main thing to be concerned about right now is search engine optimization. I wouldn't be concerned about registering duplicate domains. Uh, I would be concerned about making sure that you have good, a good SEO web and definitely being consistent. So it's easier for people to find you if you have um, consistent handles as well. So mm -hmm. if you are like, well, I'm going to register uh, my code is broken.com, my code is broken on Facebook, and my code is broken Huntsville on Instagram, it might be harder for people to find you on Instagram. I'm sure every one of us has been burned by seemingly senseless UI change. So it goes, if it ain't broke, fix it until it is broken. When a standard UI is dramatically changed, who are they changing it for? It certainly isn't for us. Do you think that your work targets mostly helping out the inexperienced users versus the experienced? Because I think of uh, an experienced user, a power user, and the UI changes and they just get extremely mad. And it may be for the better, but they've been doing it a certain way. You know, again, that goes back to what program it is, what they're trying to accomplish, and um, sometimes we're creating something from scratch. Some programs that I've worked on, um, we're creating something new, and so it doesn't so much have to do with a power user. Do you have to take the power user into account when you... Always. Okay. Um, as, you know, and I'm a power user myself of several programs, like Adobe um, programs. I would consider myself a power user of several Adobe programs, um, and... Uh, but not of others. So that would be one example of, you know, there's there's a definite learning curve. And so there's some programs like for video editing and, uh, you know, like 
animation uh-huh. where I'm I'm not a power user for those, um, but for you know graphics creation, Photoshop, those sorts of things, I'm a power user. So I know all the hotkeys and uh, you know I know a lot about you know how to create new things by just the couple clicks of a button. So you always have to take into account um, iOS. You have to take into account uh, what system they're running. There's some of these machines that you you know that they're going to be using an outdated system, and so you have to take into account what system they're running. Other UX changes are just baffling. At least they are to me. Google's new logo and icon is actually, I think, a really great move for them. Really? Everybody Um, I know hates it. (laughs) I really love it because I have always hated Google's logo. Um, I thought Google's logo looked authoritative, but the serifs, it, it feels like, um, was it kind of a blend of Times New Roman and another font, and it feels feels solid. Now it just looks like a cartoon, and I can't take it seriously. Uh, so I've always felt like it looked like a cartoon because of the primary colors, but uh, it has looked like it's been stuck in the 90s, and also um, as far as a user experience perspective, because of the uh, serifs, it reduces really badly on mobile. It also, so you get a kind of a bad experience between different versions of it. Without the serifs, the file size is actually smaller. It reduces a lot better. And also their icon is just hugely more readable and more reducible. You didn't like that lowercase g? No. (laughs) It looked like an eight. What about the simple fact that everybody I know hates it. I mean, are we just going to gradually get accustomed to that? Yeah, I think people are just resistant to change. And uh, so once they get kind of used to it and it blows over, it's like Airbnb's logo. Everybody hated Airbnb's logo. I mean, I hated Airbnb's logo. I said, you know, it looks like something dirty. It's not going to go over well. People are going to just see whatever they want to see and it's not going to it's not going to fly but you know people have just moved on they've forgotten about it and now it's really recognizable i think long term it's a good move for them i don't want to have the brand that we're I'm completely re- relying on look like a cartoon but so I, I felt i like that structure but google already owns so much of the market segment in, in reference to everyone else, that if they drop off a couple people that are like, well, I just, so most people, there's a, there's a spread of like, I, I don't like, I like it, I don't like it, I dislike it so much, I'm not going to use it. And so in that, in that distribution, there's only going to be probably like a 5% of people that are going to hate it so much that they will stop using Google's products. Do you- it will prevent them from using it. Do you, so do you think the main reasoning or perhaps motivation of this logo change is that it renders a whole lot better on mobile? Yeah, I would say that's a huge part of it because that was a huge part of their promotion of it. When you design websites with branding and UI structure, do you avoid serif fonts because of mobile issues? I would definitely avoid several serif fonts with a bevel and a gradient on them because it's, that is something that Google's old logo had. Um, I wouldn't say that I necessarily avoid serif fonts just for mobile rendering issues. Um, when you're talking about applications for the web, uh, you really have to take into, effect, into consideration your audience because when you're talking about a project that uh, my firm is doing uh, we're reaching such a small segment of the market Google has to take effect it has to take into consideration that their effect cascades down to millions of people so uh, it's it's a little bit different Uh, when you're designing for users you can say, okay, well, our users are most likely going to be Huntsvillians. They're most likely going to be between these ages. They're most likely going to be, uh, you know, 
a high percentage of males, and this is what they value. Um, for Google, they have to take much more psychology into effect and mobile responsiveness because they have to take every single device in the world into consideration. Say I'm a back-end developer and for some reason I can't afford Modern and Smart. Mm -hmm. Is there any immediate resources, books you'd recommend, or sites that I should go to that might help brush up my UX skills? Absolutely. So um, a great starter guide is um, going to be the Smashing books on UX. So there's a couple of those. They have a whole series on them, um, and they're all available online on the Smashing books ser uh, website. There's um, also Lean UX, great lean startup methodologies for UX. So if you're thinking, okay, well, I want to get something to market really fast, and I also want to do good UX, there's that's a great book to start with. Also, um, The Design of Everyday Things is a great book. Um, if you would like to get into the psychology of UX and why it works, um, Designing for Emotion by Aaron Walters is a great book to start with. Big thanks to Tara Anselone for the interview. You can find her on Twitter at Modern Tara. You can find Modern and Smart at modernandsmart.com. And now for the audio essay. It is also about UX. The title is My Design is Intentionally Broken. Enjoy. My goal is broken. Your grocery cart is full. You're ready to check out. So what do you do? You walk up and down the center aisle. No open register. Therefore, you go with what looks like a small line and just cross your fingers. Chances are you chose poorly. Current grocery store checkout is a horribly designed system and it is blatantly anti-consumer. Though they won't admit it, this bad design is likely intentional. In this audio essay for My Code is Broken, I'm going to discuss several intentionally bad UX decisions, why they are chosen, why they are bad, and a possible fix. Much like shopping lines, these are systemic UX problems that I don't expect will ever get fixed. However, if we all just sit back and accept fate, reality will never change. Grocery stores want you to spend as much time in the store as possible. It's why the low margin, frequently purchased milk and bread are often placed in the back. They can say they are maintaining the cold chain by keeping the milk close to the fridge, but that doesn't explain the bread being back there too. This mild anti-customer behavior can be excused as I can plan my shopping around it. What can't be excused is a long checkout line while my ice cream thaws, especially since the checkout line problem has a simple solution. This design being used is intentionally broken. The correct way to structure a checkout system is to have a single line to represent all the checkout stations. When any station gets free, a person from the global line can go to the next station. This way, all the stations are always full, and thus everybody gets checked out as fast as possible. The most a line can get congested is one cashier and one customer. Everybody will get routed around that congestion. As a bonus, there's now no more wandering up and down the aisles to find what may be the fastest lane only to be proven wrong by somebody using 20 coupons, checking a price, and then writing a check. What are those high margin snacks in the checkout lane? Put them in the global line. Put them in a way that forces patrons to walk around it. Boom. Problem solved. You know this works because places that are incentivized to get you out as fast as possible are already using a global queue. They already do it via a system of take a number or simply saying, may I help the next person? Think of banks, government offices, and fast food. Let's get back to development. The classic example of intentionally bad design that plagues developers and power users is good old fashioned digital rights management or DRM for short. It's this idea that you cannot do what you want with the product you paid hard cash for. Example of this include the inability to give away games purchased through Steam. Try it. You might get banned. 
Netflix's arbitrary location looks based on geographic IP addresses. This idea is a relic from DVD players being region locked for years. Nobody is immune to DRM pain. Back in 2009, President Obama gave British Prime Minister Gordon Brown 25 DVDs of classic American movies. Upon returning home, Mr. Brown could not view them due to region encoding. DRM is defective by design. The obvious fix, don't use DRM, will be ignored. So how about a compromise? Only apply the DRM to rentals, such as streaming services. I know I'm not buying the product, so I'm okay with you taking extra steps to prevent me from saving the stream. Another bad UX decision. Content spread across multiple pages. Think of listicles where a single item is pulled from a list. A stock graphic is added and then three sentences. The user then needs to click next to get to the item and the next stock graphic. Everybody hates this. The obvious answer is to put everything on one page. Designers have known for years this is what readers want, yet they won't do it. The motivation is every page load counts as an ad hit. I suppose the intentionally broken design earns too much revenue to change. Therefore, I like to propose a compromise. Make the next button trigger an Ajax call to only refresh the very small slice of content that needs refreshing. That could be the next stock image, the next new three sentences, and a fresh new ad. Having to click next all the time is annoying, but is far less annoying than having to reload an entire new page, especially on precious mobile bandwidth. The iTunes Store is another horrible offender of defective by design. It's not so much the app itself, though it is a bloated mess on Windows, it is the fact that apps shouldn't be needed at all. Every app, every song, every podcast, every everything that is available on the iTunes Store also has a permalink on the web. Apple already has an iTunes Link Maker tool to help find these permalinks. Why can't the Link Maker tool be expanded to General Search Tool and just let me buy straight from the browser. Boom! No desktop iTunes needed. Yes, I realize we could just use iTunes from the phone, but the desktop browser is nicer. Google has supported searching, buying, and installing apps from the browser for at least five years. Searching on the Play Store may be shockingly bad, but at least all the functionality is there once I have the link. Apple knows the fix, they have the tech, they just won't do it. They want you to download iTunes, and guess what? The strategy is working. Anybody that performs IT help desk duties will undoubtedly find computers with iTunes installed. Or, if iTunes installation is blocked, they will probably have their users requesting it. While we are on the topic of mobile stores, let's take a quick look at Amazon's Android-based devices. It was only recently that non-Amazon devices could play Prime Instant videos. Why was it ever restricted? Well, by limiting their Prime streaming to just Amazon's devices, that became really the only value add that Fire tablets and Fire phones could offer beyond more capable Google-powered Androids. We can thank Prime Video Streaming to other platforms due to the spectacular disaster that was the Fire Phone. Sales crashed hard, and Amazon took a $170 million write-down from it. Shortly thereafter, Amazon released Prime Video for all. Does it seem like your device breaks barely a month after the warranty expires? Intentionally broken designs happens in the physical world, too. It is a time-honored practice called planned obsolescence. There are subtle ways of doing this, such as changing connectors. We'll all be seeing this pain when we transition to the new tech called USB-C. I have mixed feelings over the arguably better USB-C cables since micro-USB cables cost just 79 cents. The same size USB-C cable is $25. Another subtle technique is making self-repairing as difficult as possible. 
Apple is a master at this. The newest MacBook has proprietary pentalobe screws, a glued down battery, and solder to the motherboard processor, RAM, and flash memory. Make sure you buy as much hardware as you may need for the life of your MacBook because there's nothing that is field upgradable. To give Apple credit, the new MacBook is very compact, lightweight, and undoubtedly well made. To give Apple additional credit, my Mac Mini lasted me five years before I donated it to charity. However, to give myself credit, the hard drive died at year four and I replaced it myself. Disassembly required a screwdriver and a putty knife. I don't have a solution for this trend of not being able to self-repair. If self-repair of your own tech is important to you, take a look at iFixit reports before buying. Anti-customer designs are everywhere, and it doesn't have to be this way. If you find one, there's a good chance it is intentional. I like to submit another one for your consideration, the entire freemium business model. While most people working in the field of UX wants to make users happy, this is a business designed purely to make users miserable. But there's a balancing act. Misery can't be too painful. Otherwise, the user might leave. It needs to be made just painful enough to make the user mad. They want to stop it so bad, they're willing to throw money at it. The time-honored way of doing this is play timers. The app simply quits after X hours. Really? Is there any consumer-friendly reason to prevent somebody from using your app? Back in the day, we called that parental controls, and it was opt-in by the parents to the dismay of the children. Even us developers are not immune from freemium. We see it when dealing with installers. How many times do you have to check to make sure the yes, give me adware box is not checked? I almost got hit with one of these because the checkbox was below the OK button after scrolling and I consider myself an expert at this. It's quite likely I've gotten hit by one and not even known it. I was about to include a bit about Java in this essay, but fortunately ever since Microsoft Security Essentials declared all but the most recent Ask Toolbar as malware, Oracle stopped shoving that garbage. But don't worry, Oracle's back. They're now shoving Yahoo's garbage. I think bundling likely unwanted programs would be okay if it was at least opt-in. I'm happy to say I've never bundled an unwanted app. However, I have seen download sites bundle adware with my apps. The first review for one of my apps was a single star and it was well deserved. The reviewer said, app does what it says, but it installed some very hard to remove adware. Yep, it sure did. But what can I do? The GPL license I gave my app allows bundling. I don't have a good solution for bundled garbage. Mac-based installers now bundle too. I think various flavors of Linux are still safe. Here's a rule of thumb. Download direct from the publisher. The publisher would be the least motivated to annoy you. It won't save you from Oracle, but it's a start. Defective by design has been around forever, but intentionally bad UX seems more recent. I'm not referring to the age-old practice of withholding features from free versions to have them in the paid version. I'm talking about needless pain to an otherwise sensible UX. It's not going to stop, but we can try to recognize when we see it and instead patronize vendors that respect us and do a better job. And that's the show. Thanks for the great feedback from show one. Find me at Nagel Code. Find Terror at Modern Terror. Goodbye. My Code is Broken, Episode 2. If you want, I can get you an advanced copy. I know a guy. Oh, I, mean, <laughs> I, I hear you know a lot of people.